morning and welcome to the latest ESIS podcast. My name is Alison McGurr and I'm an Improvement Manager with ESIS and in my company today is Dr Jordan Bowen. Would you like to introduce yourself Jordan please? Thank you so much, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm a consultant in geriatrics and uh, in acute medicine. Uh, I work at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford and I'm the clinical lead for acute medicine and ambulatory care. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, we've had a little chat beforehand and I have watched some of your other YouTube uh, clips which were very informative. Today I want to look at STEC or ambulatory care from another angle. You've spoken before about uh, referrals into the hospital and how that's managed. What I'd like to talk about today really is about when a patient arrives in your emergency department and that cultural shift of how you move patients swiftly and quickly and safely to your ambulatory area um, and for our ED consultants letting go of those patients and specialists letting go and how you manage your ambulatory service in that respect and that cultural change. Uh, well, uh, thanks so much for the question. And just um, so we get uh, ourselves clear about the terminology I'm going to use. So um, the, the, the contemporary term is is, is, is ESTEC, same to emergency care, um, as an evolution of ambulatory care. And, and our unit is called the Ambulatory Assessment Unit, or AAU. But I'll use ambulatory and ESTEC interchangeably. Um, and it's worth me just clarifying what the process of um, uh, the, our SDEC or our AAU is in, in the General Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Um, I think the caveat for anybody talking about the, these is that different SDECs work in different ways and they react to different local circumstances. Um, and I'm always careful to, to stress that the way we've done things is not the way, it's one way. Um, and it's worked in many ways for us um, and we continue to evolve. So um, our, our SDEC has been set up to be very much acute medicine led rather than uh, led from the perspective of an, of an emergency clinician. Uh, you've asked specifically about patients arriving into the emergency department um, and we have a very fluid means at the moment by which patients arriving um, very quickly get streamed to our ambulatory unit. Um, our ambulatory unit is uh, four floors above um, the uh, the emergency department um, so it's it, it's geographically dislocated um, the when we first started that culture that awareness that ability to to stream patients wasn't there and so uh, what we did when we first started was we uh, we uh, had a pull model which was that um, a consultant, me, or two of my other colleague consultants. So when we first started, there were the, there was one consultant only working with one nurse only in two rooms um, in the hospital, and that was our our, our SDEC. So we started very very small, and our job was to uh, scrutinise what was arriving into the emergency department, and then taking those patients that we thought we'd be able to manage within our SDEC unit. And that has evolved over four years where now the uh, culture of streaming, we no longer do much of a pool model. Now it's a streaming model where the triage nurse predominantly, and I'll say for our, our triage nurse colleagues, both in, in uh, the hospital and also uh, by my experience elsewhere, there is no one better to manage in the fog of war of uncertainty with a patient just arriving, being able to make a decision as to whether or not they're suitable to go up to an ambulatory unit or an SDEC. We've shared criteria, but actually you've mentioned the idea of culture and that is what predominantly informs the ability to stream. The way we, the way we formed that culture has actually been um, the constant presence and conversation and feedback looping and non-critical feedback um, and suggestion and all the tough stuff which doesn't get written, written down um, and discovering that when things go wrong, when you have a patient that arrives that you didn't expect or didn't um, match what you thought was going to arrive, 
that that actually is to be expected because people are working with incomplete information. So we started with a pool model led by consultants. We've now arrived at a streaming model delivered by triage nurses in ED. Um, and I think we've got to the stage where our emergency department colleagues are happy that patients are arriving and very quickly leaving to go to, our, to an ESTIC because they're confident that the ESTIC has the workforce that is able to handle whatever the issues are arriving. All we insist on is a story, brief, a set of observations, whether that's done by the paramedics or whether it's done by the nurses, and in the context of ongoing chest pain is an ECG, but we don't ask for um, a uh, medical assessment, we don't ask for an examination. Sometimes we suggest an x-ray on the way because that makes sense, the patient has to walk past the x-ray department. Um, uh, but more often than not, our default response is, yes, send the patient and we will deal with whatever we find and we rely on the triage nurse's acumen. And it's the, the unintended consequences list in around five to 10% of their arriving patients. And you can, you can apply that to pretty much any undifferentiated patient arriving early on into the, it, 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 into the hospital. They, they turn up with something you didn't expect. Um, our ambulatory unit, uh, our SDEC is well staffed with senior doctors. From the beginning, we had a senior doctor present. Now we have senior and junior doctors, um, but we had the clinical workforce who could deal with one, the unexpected, two, the difficult, the complex, the undifferentiated, and three, the seniority to be able to own risk. And so a lot of the development of the ESTEC relies on what is the the clinical leadership either present on the shop floor or nominally by giving their name to the to the work delivered by the the the, the SDEC workers in owning risk. So for example, the, the the older person who desperately wants to go home, who's well set up at home, um, and yet has some medical illness that would normally require would normally result in bed-based care in hospital, can we own that risk of going home? And our discovery has been putting the, the ownership of risk in people at a junior level of training or in people who aren't used to owning risk. So some um, non-medical colleagues, for example, um, that means that only the, the kind of low hanging fruit, the easy stuff gets sent home and not the difficult stuff. So we've from the beginning tried very hard that the whole culture of our ESTEC includes a senior clinician that is putting their name to the ownership of the patient, one, and then two, that that senior clinician themselves feels confident in the organizational backing. So um, when uh, a patient does get uh, ambulated, uh, uh, ESTEC to create verbs, um, that when a proportion of those return, because they do, because you have to have um, uh, a uh, the possibility that that's going to happen within your expectation and, and service delivery, that there isn't a criticism or a reaction by saying this decision was unsafe and we should not do make decisions like this anymore. So um, that's so we what we mentioned is in the beginning there was a pool approach by a senior clinician didn't have to be a big department that had the responsibility for risk. Um, and the backing of the organization. Um, and that has evolved now over several years to a streaming model from the emergency department. The important thing I need to say is that only about 10% of the total volume of patients through our ESTEC comes from the emergency department. It's not very many. Yeah. And it's in terms of the big uh, um, volume of patients that goes through our emergency department every day, it's a small proportion. Um, and we don't have a, a, a large emergency department compared to some others. We see 300 uh, patients per 24 hours or 350. And I know there are some places that will see more than double that. Mm -hmm. So um, it certainly feels busy, but that's the volume that we deal with. So if I take out five or 10 patients from that 350 number, that's 
barely felt by the emergency department. 90% of our activity is intercepting patients before they arrive in the emergency department. So that's the other big bit of activity that we've tried really deliberately to evolve over the years, which is to say more and more, we want to intercept a patient that is coming to the emergency department before they've walked through the door. Yeah. And that's because either we've spoken to the GP who's planning on sending the patient to the emergency department. And that's quite an easy, familiar thing for most uh, medical systems to, to, to do. GP phones the phones ahead and, and refers to the medical team. So we take all the medical referrals by default via our SDEC unit. Only the emergencies, the true resuscitation patients, get diverted to our emergency assessment unit. Secondly, though, is over the last couple of years, we've evolved into accepting referrals from any referrer in the community, knowing that our community colleagues aren't just met, uh, doctors, but are um, the uh, uh, um, uh, non-medical staff, advanced nurse practitioners, um, senior nurses working in community hospital, um, other non-nurse, non-medical uh, um, allied health professionals who are still capable of making decisions about patients coming to hospital, or at least discussing. So we are not old fashioned in our view as to who ought to make the referral to um, to the hospital. And then the real uh, big inflection point in our um, in in how we've intercepted patients coming to the hospital uh, is our interaction with paramedics. So we have an excellent regional um, uh, ambulance trust, um, South Central Ambulance um, and uh, over the last couple of years, we've evolved a default by which the paramedic in front of the patient is able to phone ahead and able to say, this isn't an emergency, but I think this patient needs to come to the hospital and we'll speak to a senior clinician. So that's me taking the phone, exactly the same phone number as a GP. Um, and we discuss a patient and agree that the patient ought to come directly to our ambulatory unit rather than otherwise to the emergency department, which would be the normal disposition. Um, and there's been a lot of work more recently on trying to evolve that model um, and uh, trying to activate community-based response. Um, and we've got a, uh, a urgent community response program at the moment, which complements this habit now uh, regionally of um, the ambulance uh, trust phoning ahead to the SDEC and able to one, agree that a patient comes to ESTEC rather than ED. Two, agree that a patient that doesn't need to come to hospital at all, but has the rubber stamping of a senior clinician that they've spoken to in the hospital. So that's that might be me and my name and my accountability. And then three is that we agree an alternative to attendance. So that might be come tomorrow because um, tomorrow makes more sense than coming tonight. Or it might be go to a different location, such as a local clinic. Um, or it might be that we activate some of our hospital at home um, toolkit. So we have a hospital at home service that we'll send patients, um, uh, we'll send out to patients in their own homes. And that's really what we want to work on as a growth area. Intercepting arrivals to the emergency department before they've arrived to the emergency department makes up 90% of our activity. So I think it's really important to map out the value of that alongside the strategy by which we take patients out of the emergency department. Mm -hmm. um, and the, my final comment on that is that our default for every patient is that rather than coming to the emergency department, rather than coming to our emergency assessment unit, unless they are true emergency, by default, they will come to our SDEC. By default, we will intend for them to go home. And those defaults set, set out explicitly helps everyone frame how they're going to approach a patient and helps patients frame them frame frame themselves, which is I'm coming to a unit that expects me to go home today. And that helps manage expectations, which is a big theme in um, in, in all of all of ESTEC. Um, that means that complex patients, patients with frailty syndromes, frailty presentations, and not just the easy chest pain, swollen leg, cellulitis, which is one of the taxonomies of SDEC type suitable patients. Um, complex patients are the ones that we think we deliver greatest value to in 
intervening on a default to bed based care resulting in a prolonged admission. I'm a geriatrician. I'm very comfortable with seeing uh, complex, uh, undifferentiated and frail presentations. Um, and we've tried very hard to make sure that our workforce is primed to dealing with complexity and not just with organ specific diagnoses. That was my long answer to your question. And you've covered quite a lot there and it's all very, really, you know, really rich information. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think again, and you've mentioned a lot of that, which is posing more questions for me really about a lot of people ask me about SOPs, criteria, guidelines, and what you've mentioned there is about patients intervening very early on, avoiding that ED attendance where possible, but also about being very open to you are ambulatory or an STEC patient unless you're really unwell, and you know that you're, the expectation is that we will spend a lot of time with you and and try and get you home. So I suppose there's two parts of my question. One is about your SOPs and guidelines and criteria, because when I hear the word criteria, I think that can be quite limiting and I'd be interested in your view on that. And I think the second thing, listening to people across the country talking about, oh, we have very low conversion rate to admission and that's a good thing. Whereas to me, that would mean that actually we need to see more patients because a conversion rate to admission is not a bad thing. So I just would be interested in your view on those two things, please, Jordan. Thank you. So they're really great points, and 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 I'm not sure we've reconciled a answer that will satisfy everyone. Mm. I'll tell you our approach, and for exactly the same reason that you've said, we've hesitated to formalize what we see into a criteria or a, a standard operating procedure, because we've recognized that we're in an evolving system. And we haven't wanted to constrain the decisions um, with something so explicit as, as criteria. Now, on, we get asked a lot for the criteria and we understand why people are seeking it. Um, what we've tried very hard to prioritize is sort of principle led approach, which is and the principle is one, how do we set our defaults, right? So by default, an, a patient ought to be coming to an ambulatory unit, uh, ESTEC unit, ought to be expected to go home unless specifically you prove that they are in need of emergency care or they're in need of, of bed-based care. That's an inversion of the normal default that we've all grown up with, which is a patient will lie in bed until someone um, uh, proactively puts energy into a system to get them home. Um, the path of least resistance is lying in the bed. And uh, so we've tried to invert the path of least resistance into the path of least resistance is going home. Um, and that, that um, removing the frictions are at the system level, but also at a cognitive level. Um, we want the system and we want clinicians to feel capable of uh, tailoring a uh, set of decisions, a strategy to a patient's individual circumstances, um, not constrained by a set of criteria that says you've got to admit the patient with a subdural hemorrhage or with uh, NSTEMI or with renal failure, um, because we believe that there are circumstances in which patients with every version of severity can still be managed at home once you take into account the patient's agenda. Um, and if you excluded those patients from attending an ambulatory unit, you wouldn't expose patients to the possibility that the, that, 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 um, the ambulatory approach might benefit them. Now, that isn't to say that our emergency department colleagues, acute medicine colleagues, and I work in, in, in acute medicine in, 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 in uh, my other work as well. Um, that isn't to say we don't do that. What um, we try very hard is to make sure that the ambulatory environment is as conducive to making a tailor-made uh, patient centre package that helps them be managed at home when possible, more so than any other environment. Um, so that's why we don't have criteria with the exception of um, stroke and needle thrombolysis, uh, 
um, someone who's in shock, so sepsis to shock or or, or, or um, uh, other causes of shock, um, and a, a, a chest pain needing primary PCI. So, you know, those seem quite obvious and those are the exceptions we've made. Of course, there are also trauma. So anybody with um, uh, with uh, suspected trauma and injury, so broken bones and or head injury, um, most of us would imagine that that's an emergency department attendance. Um, and then um, the other classical surg uh, surgical or other specialty attendances. Now, we all are familiar with gray areas between specialties. You know, the, uh, the, the abdominal pain, um, uh, we know lands in different locations, the uh, cellulitis, facial cellulitis, et cetera. I think every trust has their individual agreement and there are still gray areas. We say, look, if there isn't a clear cut accepting specialty, by default, we will still see the patient and make a decision when they're in front of us. So we try very hard not to play that game of specialty ping pong. Um, mm -hmm. We've got an agreement with, uh, by which we see um, uh, GI bleeds, upper and lower GI bleeds with our surgical colleagues, um, which works very well. Um, and uh, so, so and because our criteria, our, our, our willingness to see things and our discovery about phenotypes of presentation is evolving, um, then we've still not written down the criteria, the SOP, other than saying that by default, we will see patients whom we think it's suitable to see. And that's a bit of an unsatisfying answer. And yet that's how we've got on uh, for this amount of time. Um, we have for the doc for the, the, the rotating doctors that come into our ambulatory unit, we have a training program where we discuss the principles um, uh, and we discuss different phenotypes of presentation. So when I say phenotypes, we all know that there are patients presenting with already a suspected diagnosis, possible PE or possible DVT, but the majority of patients present with a syndrome of symptoms um, and often that results in there being something that you didn't anticipate cancer being a major one. So mm -hmm. not quite right um, and attend hospital and oh gosh, there is cancer because you discovered on doing a scan um, or, or on further investigation. So there's the, there's the diagnosis specific type of presentation. There is a syndromic type of presentation. And then there's the complex type of presentation, which is um, the older person I, I alluded to earlier. So acute illness plus a change in functional state needing an MDT um, uh, or comprehensive, comprehensive geriatric assessment approach. Um, again, it's very hard within criteria to account for those kinds of phenotypes of presentation. And so my what we've tried very hard to impress uh, on um, both our, our uh, local system, but also our advice to other SDECs is that the value that one adds is not in selecting the classical, easy, low hanging fruit of the low risk chest pains, the swollen leg, the cellulitis, but rather in being open to every version of presentation that patients come to hospital with. Um, uh, and that's why we make these differentiations between phenotypes of presentation. And then we staff according to um, our needs to still offer excellent care as much to the patient with a PE as to a patient with a new diagnosis of cancer, as to a patient with a fall reduced mobility um, and, uh, and, and social care needs. Um, and in fact, if I had a preference, I would remove our tendency to see low risk chest pains in favor of seeing the more difficult complex cases. You mentioned tr conversion rate. So these principles are interlinked. Um, and when one selects to see, or when one defines an SDEC to see uh, easy, definable, or low risk presentations, then it is unsurprising that a conversion rate ends up being low. Um, and 
And I think you have to peg a conversion rate to what kind of things a nest X sees. Um, if all you have is a junior doctor or um, and without discrediting our incredible um, uh, non-medical colleagues or or, or a, a low nurse to run an ESTEC, then it's not surprising that what you have to filter through the ESTEC is going to be the the easier things. But if you think at a, at a, at a system level to what's what value are we adding? Well, the value added um, a, with with the easy inverted commas stuff is probably efficiency of scale. You can you, you, yeah. you, you can you can move um, the bunch of swollen legs and the cellulitis and the um, uh, and the chest pains into an environment that sees it quite frequently and then is quite rapid in, in, in doing the tests. But whether it's the SDEC or whether it's the emergency department, whether it's GP that sees the patients, they'll all be sent home on the same day. So you, what you're not doing is saving a prolonged uh, admission. The, the prolonged admissions are saved, saved um, by being willing to apply the ambulatory mentality to the difficult, severe, complex cases. And that's why when I answered your last question, I mentioned the presence of a senior decision maker that is a, willing to own risk. Um, when you have that principle-led uh, uh, model of ambulatory care, then a conversion rate ought to go up. And the con so our conversion rate sits between 8 and 12 percent. Um, and we aim for about 12 percent. And what that tells us is, so I see about 60 patients every day in 12 hours um, are uh, that that is routinely um, between 50 and 75 percent of the medical take. Um, and so up to six of those patients will be admitted, about half of them under specialties and half of them under medicine, um, with uh, with a day to day uh, vari uh, variability. So, I mean, sometimes on one day you admit one patient, on another day you admit eight patients. Mm -hmm. That's not failure. That is the role of the ambulatory unit because the other 50 patients are being sent home who hopefully would otherwise have taken up a bed. So our conversion rate sits at um, uh, 8 to 12 percent. That's been pretty static. Our volume of patients has grown month to month over the last four years, um, and we've now seen over 55,000 patients. And so we get a pretty good idea about where we're setting our thresholds. Now, I'll tell you something fascinating, is that during the last pandemic, we ran our emergency assessment unit um, through our ambulatory unit. That means that every emergency and uh, as well as our normal ambulatory bound patients um, got managed within the same unit with the ambulatory approach. And that was because we use our existing uh, emergency ass assessment unit as a high dependency unit to manage COVID patients. When we did that, when we included the emergency patients, our conversion rate went up to 18%. Now, normally that conversion rate when in the emergency assessment unit would sit around 45, uh, sorry, 55%. What that means is that an ambulatory environment is able to maximize the probability that a uh, complex patient, sick patient is able to go home, um, assuming of course, staffing etc and 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 we want to be conscious of the risks on to safety uh, um, and not we're not just taking unnecessary risks so, so that's my caveat um the point being that there must be a conversion rate that it shouldn't be too low or too high but it should also be pegged to um what kind of unit is being run mm -hmm. um and um so that was that was my answer about do we have criteria? No, we have principles. Sounds a little bit um, uh, 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 sounds a little bit highfalutin, doesn't it? Um, but we really stand by that. Um, and how do we measure our our um, uh, are we uh, our thresholds? And that is with with that conversion rate um, of of twelve percent. Um, if anybody runs a principle led unit like we do and runs a lower conversion rate, I absolutely want to know how they do it. Fantastic. That's really, really helpful. And I think it will really stimulate uh, the mindset, you know, when people listen to this and sort of the principles and not get bogged down by criteria. I think what 
again it leads on to that for me and as you, you you alluded to there about if you've got a senior uh, consultant leadership you can take more risk really because you've got that senior uh, review so that leads me into not everybody will have you know, the same resources that's going to vary uh, from from one organization to another so i just would be interested in your view about what you think is absolutely necessary to run an SDEC and you know you know, what the support services you would feel are necessary to keep to keep that ambulatory service uh, churning the way that you would expect it to. Um, so uh, we've been very, very fortunate in uh, in the John Radcliffe um, and there's been a lot of hard work, but there's also been a lot of support and resourcing. But I will say that when we first started, so I I was appointed a consultant in 2015, and it was my first job to do, to to set up the ambulatory unit alongside two colleagues um, who had a GP and hospital backgrounds. Um, and what we worked was one consultant, um, 12 hours per day, seven days a week, one in three, um, and it was us. So one consultant and a nurse, um, and then that grew over months to include a cs uh, a clinical support worker and then another nurse and then there came a registrar um but that happened over time and we've moved locations three times from uh one set of available rooms to another uh vacated ward to now a bespoke uh ambulatory unit um and our experience has been that the that the delivery of ambulatory care as we've seen it doesn't require a huge amount of resourcing to get started on and there is enough um uh fodder raw material to get going straight away now we rejoiced in the first few weeks when we were seeing five patients per day um, and, and and now you know we we do 60 patients per day um, and so that just gives you an indication that it doesn't have to be large now i do i found it very important that there be a senior clinician and that's because the senior clinician sets the waypoint for where's a threshold for risk ownership yeah. as well as being accountable as well as when you're going to stand on the toes of other specialties and colleagues who are unfamiliar with the ambulatory approach or disagree with what can be sent home versus what needs to be in hospital and that should happen you know when we're changing systems there should be some friction and we've come out the other end but it has been i've heard it from you know certainly experienced it firsthand and heard it from other colleagues doing the same in other trusts um that ability to shoulder the friction again it's helpful when it's a senior person um i'm conscious that there are some trusts who don't have mm. consultant time spare um so i think it doesn't have to be a consultant but it's got to be it, it, it's got to be a clinician who's willing to explore what hasn't been done before in the in the trust and has the backing of the organization. And that's the other big, big important thing. The organization has to, has to make the people delivering ASTEC that they're supported, that they're supported in, I keep on talking about this risk, the, the risk holding. I'm not talking about being gung ho or, um, or, or ignoring risk or being unsafe, but rather being measured nuanced about what risks are being taken in the context of the patient agenda and the system needs um, and so having the backing of the uh, organizational structures both low down uh, and also high up so we've had our we were set up in a directorate and a division and then an executive format i've had the immediate backing of the divisional director, um, uh, the, the the director, uh, the, the the clinical director, the, the the divisional director, the executive, saying mm -hmm. yes, I know it's hard. Keep on going. You're going to get some more resourcing. So that makes a massive difference. Um, I think that uh, it it helps for it to feel worthwhile. Mm 
I feel very strongly that um, there is a lot of value in what we do in both to patients at an individual level and then to the system in the context of a congested system. So it is harder than doing normal bed based acute medicine. And it's got to feel worth it. You know, you've got to feel like there is some satisfaction in what you do. So I think it's important to create an environment for work that the people who are delivering SDEC feel like it's worth it. If it's not valued either by the people doing it or by the people who are supporting it, then there isn't going to be growth and there isn't going to be the appetite to take on yeah. uh, the unusual types of presentation. Now, actually, I'm sure that there are plenty of successful ethics that that, that work purely on a, a high turnover uh, on a high turnover model. I think that there is real opportunity in really progressing into those um, uh, undifferentiated, difficult areas. So that's uh, um, but I'm saying that in a very biased way. So I'd say ideally a senior clinician willing to push the, um, the, the, the norms in an organization with the backing of the organization. But in the absence of a senior clinician, a a, a, a willing clinician who's got the backing. Um, our resources for our unit have come in arrears. We're all we've always worked beyond what we're resourced to and then got the resource, if that makes sense, whether it's people, whether it's space, whether it's kit. And it'd be lovely to have said, right, we're going to have a one point two million pound unit and a bunch of people. And once they've got that, we're going to get going with our SDEC. Obviously, that's not how it works most of the time, um, and it hasn't worked like that with with us. But that's where we've ended up, and that's a, a, after a, a, a lot of hard work. And I, 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 I've mentioned the term consultant quite a bit. Um, I have to stress the value of the non-medical team. We've tried really hard to create a flat hierarchy. And although it started with a doctor, it was started with a doctor working alongside a nurse where we really valued the parallel um, professions working alongside each other. We know each other by our first names. We don't want any obstacle to, based on hierarchy or communication, to get in the way of uh, the um, uh, strategies to get patients home and because we work under difficult circumstances often containing uh, risk expectations volume system pressure etc then it makes a real difference to have a working culture which is quite close um, so that's my other bit which is to say if you've got someone senior and the organizational backing make sure that the working environment is one which is able to be resilient in the face of increasing pressure. Well, isn't that the challenge for any trust? Um, but um, how does one do that? And I think that comes down to the, the, the attitude of the people. But I usually tend to find people willing to work hard in unusual circumstances to give something a go are also the kind of people who like to work together as a team. Uh, thank you so much for your time and um, we will be back in touch again, no doubt, but I'm, you know, I was very keen to cover those areas because I think there's been a lot of ambiguity and a lot of different, you know, sort of um, thoughts, I suppose, about how uh, STEC would be run in that way. And I think you provoked a lot of that thought and I think um, will will help other organisations in, in moving forward and stepping up to another level in providing a, um, an STEC ambulatory service. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for the invitation. Bye.